Take, take it away from Jason. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amanda Wiggins, and I have the honor of serving as the Miranda Chamber of Commerce President and CEO. Thank you so much for being here for Miranda Mornings for October. This is one of the programs our chamber um, loves to be able to put on. We're really proud to bring this content to our members, to our community. Um, and um, thank you again for being here. A couple uh, announcements and, and uh, we have folks here in the room as well as a few virtually. It looks like a lot of our attendees chose to come in person today, which is a great thing. Welcome. Um, but we do have some incredible people online as well. So want you to know that, um, that you know, they can ask questions here. You can in, in person as well. Um, the other things I want to is we uh, recognize we have Council Member John Officer with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, as well as Marina Chamber of Commerce Board Member Betty Kobe. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, with that, a couple announcements. The Marina Map and Guide. A lot of you have seen that. Um, we are re getting ready to publish the 2023. So all of our Marina uh, Chamber members are in there, as well as a lot of uh, helpful information about our town, our community, um, as way you know, in way of education, public safety, um, health care. So these, this is a, a resource that realtors use, that the university, the um, Pima Community College uses. Um, you can't go many places without seeing it at the front of a, a business or a, a hotel here in Marana. So um, we just want you to know that there are advertising opportunities in there and ways as a member to enhance your listing among that. And so I just tell you that because we have so many people who say, I wish I would have known. And it's a whole nother year before we publish it again. So this is a magic moment. Um, we are, um, the end of November is when it starts to go to print so that we can have the new one by um, January. So we'd like you to um, remember that. Um, the next thing I wanna highlight is that we have uh, Miranda Mornings next week. Um, so that's the first Wednesday of every month. Um, another great event that the Miranda Chamber hosts. Um, we're gonna be at the Barn Fire Mesquite Grill and um, that happens each month on the first Wednesday. Uh, so with that, thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to our fearless moderator, Jenny Huffman, who's the owner broker with Imagine Realty Services. Thank you, Jenny, for being here and the show is yours. All right, thank you, Amanda. So again, welcome everyone. And um, as we know, this is our last one for this year. Um, so we, we go dark over the holidays, and then we'll be back up again in January. So um, looking forward to seeing the room even more full come January. Okay, so our first presenter is Jason Angel, Development Services. And I think you're also going to be I wasn't aware of that part. Uh, typical Kurt doesn't give me all the details. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Jenny, thank you. Um, my name is Jason Angel. I'm the Development Services Director. And based upon introductions, I think we have a team here that we probably build a couple of projects and sell a number of projects. So, um, I give you a handout. I'm not going to go through that. That is our annual development activity report. We put that together. We just uh, wrapped that up a couple of weeks ago. So there's a lot of information in there about uh, permits and valuations and projects, highlighting certain projects and that. I'm not going to go through that, but some of those might be reflected uh, as part of the presentation here. Um, there's a lot of different development activity going on within the community. Obviously, SFRs have slowed down uh, the last couple of months. Uh, right now, we're averaging about 40 SFRs, um, but there's still a lot of development activity that's going on out there. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I've broken the map down into three different areas. The gold uh, banners are reflective of residential development, and the blue banners are reflective of commercial or apartment style uh, development. Um, this in, in the North Marana area is where we're seeing uh, a lot of the activity happening right now. Gladden Farms, uh, the Mandarina development, which is over on the east side, is where you see a lot of the earthwork that's being done. A lot of people are always asking what's going on over on the east side of Tangerine and I-10. That is the Mandarina development. That is proposed for 2,500 lots. Uh, they're currently working through the platting of that right now. There is a mixture of some apartment style as well as some commercial pads that are there, but predominantly it is detached uh, single family development. 
Uh, Gladden Farms, Gladden Farms too is pretty much built up. I mean, they're still working through to get through uh, the last couple of blocks there. Uh, but then they move into, we call it Glen Farms 3, but it's really Crossroads is what they call it. Uh, if you haven't been up there recently, actually yesterday, the Flint development is the commercial development that is right near the, the frontage road here. Flint development is currently working on two distribution facilities. One is 511,000 square feet. The other one is 435,000 square feet. They just poured the foundation or part of the foundation for one of those buildings. And to put that in context, the, the Amazon facility that's over here at I-9 Silverbell, that's 220,000 square feet. So that put that in comparison <laughs> to the, the size of the buildings that are going up there. Um, Glenn Farms, uh, also what is going on there, they're right next to Tangerine, next to the fire station over there. Uh, you'll see the, the community building that went up uh, there and then there's a pool that's in the front. They're working on that. Uh, Crown West, uh, they're putting up their rental community that is going in that location. So it's one of the first rental communities that's starting to come out of the ground. Uh, the homes for rent, uh, the casita style rentals are really hot right now. Uh, and so we're starting to see those uh, come out of the ground and it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact that has in the community, um, especially with those that were trying to buy a home or those that don't want to or can't afford to buy a home right now, um, but don't want to live in an apartment. So it's another housing option within the community. Also over on Tangerine, uh, projects that are there, Ventana Medical is close to wrapping up their expansion. That's a 60,000 square foot expansion uh, that they're about to, to move in there. Southwest Gas is planned over there for their, their regional headquarters. We haven't seen any movement yet as far as the plans coming in and, and being reviewed, but they have purchased the property and they are still planning to move forward with that project. CTI Trucking, you probably can't see it right now um, because uh, tear in the corn is blocking everyone's view of it. Um, but uh, CTI Trucking is doing all their earthwork right now to move their operations from uh, Avra Valley Road up to that location. So it'll be their trucking location with a small uh, 20,000 square foot uh, office shop building that'll be going in there. Quick Trip obviously is open uh, in that location. And then U-Haul uh, is planning to build a facility over there as well. Uh, one thing to note on the crossroad side, um, there was plans for a large, like significantly large 1.4 million square foot Amazon facility was gonna be built there. They backed out as part of their whole national change. Shamrock has purchased that property into 80 acres. Um, We've had preliminary discussions with them on their plans, but uh, there's no immediate uh, plans to move forward with the development at this time. These are just a couple of, that's the Ventana Medical Facility uh, over there. And then this is just a, a rendering of one of the Southern Arizona Logistics or the Flint Development Project. For this distribution type facility, what they do is they cover it up, it'll be like three or four different tenants that go in there. So it's not gonna be one big 500,000 square foot user that goes in there. There'll be probably three or four uh, multiple tenants that go in there. So as we move into central uh, Marana, you've got the Twin Peaks corridor still seeing a lot of residential developments. Warrow Bloom uh, is moving forward uh, still. So Warrow Bloom is 2,500 units that are planned out there. They're a little over halfway through, so it's 1,500 residential units that have been constructed out there. De Anza is the KB development that's closer down to Cortero here. And then Linda Vista Village, actually Sean and I were just uh, talking about this. If you drive out by the mall and you're heading out, say by like uh, Mountain View High School or going to Arthur Pack or you're going golfing out that way, you drive by and you see a lot of earthwork, you're like, what's going on out there? Linda Vista Village, that is American, uh, American Homes for Rent is building there. Uh, and that's 430 lots, um, but they're not planning on taking down the entire thing. Uh, right now, they're planning on moving forward with about 280 homes uh, as part of this first phase. The majority of the activity that we see right now uh, in Central is at the uh, Alvin Mall or the Miranda Center, which is great. We know it's been a long time since we've seen some activity out there, so we're excited to see that. Uh, Bill Luke 
is the auto dealership that is currently under construction there. Um, and Cantata Apartments, those things are flying out. Uh, if you've been over there recently, that's, uh, they're moving quite nicely there. Uh, there's also an indoor storage facility that is a mixture of just general storage, but then there's also some RV storage that'll be part of that uh, indoor facility. Quick Trip uh, is under construction there. There's another hotel that's planned, that's Spring Hill Suites, that's 96 rooms that'll go up there. Uh, and then American Home Furniture uh, is going to be building between the Luke Auto Dealership and the mall, a 235,000 square foot facility there. Uh, those plans are currently in for review. Uh, so we would anticipate shortly after the first of the year, they'll be breaking ground and moving forward on that project. And then TMC has purchased 37 acres uh, out there. So between all those projects, the mall property is occupied. Uh, Cortero Ranch, uh, going down here, uh, there's a uh, the storage facility that's currently under construction. There is, uh, there's another hotel uh, that is planned uh, down there as well. Uh, um, so there's another hotel and then there's a Mazda dealership uh, that is planned uh, to go down there as well. So there's only one pad left in all of that area, which is actually to the west of the new multi-tenant space that just opened up there. That is left, it's a small little pad, but otherwise all of that area is also spoken. So Spring Hill Suites, American Furniture Warehouse, and then the Encantana apartments that are going up by the mall is a new product. So I think many of us who drive around and you see an Encantada apartment, and you're like, yeah, I know it just before you even you know, see the sign, you know who built it. They are doing new architecture for that building. So it'll be a new modern look for them. Um, so we're excited to see how that one rolls out. Moving down to the South, it's all commercial or apartments. Um, we'll start up uh, by Cortero there, the album uh, apartment project. That is the one uh, next to Lehman. Uh, they're going very nice there, moving along very well. 141 units, that's an age-restricted facility, uh, 55 and older, uh, that's moving along. Coming down on Silver Bell, uh, the place uh, is uh, another apartment complex that's also going vertical with a couple of buildings, 300 units that are planned there. The distribution center for the most part is done. Everyone, we get all the questions. Is Amazon still moving in there? Is Amazon bought? Amazon has purchased the property. They are still planning to move forward with it. They're, they're slow rolling it right now. What they're doing is they're waiting for the new uh, conveyor system to be delivered. Um, it's the new model of their conveyor system. So what they didn't want to do is put in the old one and replace it two months later. It's a big piece of equipment and it takes a lot to install that. So they're waiting for that new conveyor system and then they'll be moving into that facility. Hey, uh, yes. Um, Amazon, are they ever gonna finish the intersection construction that's been going on there forever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they just move calls in and then they move away and then they're in. Yeah, I don't know what the- We're the, done with that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be nice when it's all yes. done. Yes, okay. it's. I mean, seriously, do they have a completion timeline in, in your world to say we'll be done in two months, six months? I don't five know what the schedule, Eric, do you know what the I schedule is? Yeah, I can double check on that and see what the, the schedule is on that. Yeah. Uh, Ascent Apartments uh, on the south side, that is currently in for review. That's 210 units as well there. Now let's move over to the east side of 10. Uh, I'm not going to steal any of Daniel or Alexi's thunder on this. So Alexander Apartments uh, and Solstice Apartments. The Solstice are the Casita style. The Alexander is an apartment style. There's also some uh, commercial pads that are in front of that project. Uh, so moving along very nice over there. And then uh, the Cortero Ranch, here it is, My Place Hotel uh, and the Mazda dealership. So, a lot of development activity. Uh, the album apartments, that's the one up by uh, Lehman uh, distribution. Uh, the place, which is the one just north of the distribution facility. And the solstice is the one on the south side. So all of that 
I'll just run through some general numbers. Total SFRs that are permitted, uh, which are, when I say permitted, these are the ones that are, have either been permitted this year or are going through um, the reviews for platting and all that. 3,371 units. Lots that are platted and planned, which means entitlements in these areas are over 13,000. Apartments that are currently under construction are 1,412. The apartment units that are currently being reviewed and are planned are 1,200 units. So 2,600 units in apartments. Typically we see one apartment complex every three to five years and it's 300 units. So we have quite a bit of uh, rental. Commercial square footage that is currently under construction or about to be under construction is 1.8 million square feet. That's the, the activity that we're seeing right now. So although it's been slow from the SFR side of things, Danielle and I were talking about it beforehand, uh, in our office, it hasn't slowed down really much at all. It's flipped to where now we're focused more on the commercial and the apartment style or the planning and entitlement side of it. Whereas two years prior was hurry up and get the permits out so people can start building homes and getting all that. So, that's what I have for you. I know Daniel wanted 45 minutes. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. The 2500 bottle on the Alpha Pain and Tangerine Road, how many people <clears throat> get out on the bike then? Because right now it's backed up a road. So, once upon a time. Yes. I live in Glen Farms too, so I, I deal with that quite a bit. Amanda lives in Glen Farms as well. <laughs> uh, actually, we've had quite a bit, and, and the town manager, Terry Rosema, is here as well. Um, we've had quite a bit of discussions uh, over the last several months, and actually back when Crossroads was um, starting their development discussions with us, that was part of the early conversation. So there are some interim improvements uh, that are gonna be planned uh, for that interchange. Uh, there's going to be some additional turning lanes that are added to help for those that are on Tangerine trying to get onto I-10. Mm -hmm. uh, we're dealing with ADOT as far as ramp improvements in that area. But underneath uh, Tangerine or I-10, Tangerine going underneath, they're going to be adding some lanes as well. It's going to look similar to what you see at Cortero as far as the lanes are. And I know we all cringe when we say Cortero, yeah. uh, but... Uh, <laughs> It's to add additional lanes, additional stacking and storage. Those traffic lights that are there are also going to be moved a little bit to provide additional space for uh, stacking underneath there. Um, yes? The 2500, is that a planned community or is it just 2500 homes? Uh, it's, it's a planned community. I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, the Mandarina development. Uh, sorry, Amanda, I'm gonna flip mm -hmm. way back yeah. to the beginning. And so the Mandarina development is 2,500 units, but it's apartments, it's casita style, it's detached single family uh, that are going in there. No clubhouse, golf course, restaurant, nothing. Not like them now. No, no. Got it. Okay. Yep. Anyone else? Yeah. Sorry. Since you mentioned Cortero. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I know it's not part of the RTA any of that kind of development, but is there anything ever in the future for um, doing that? You know? So the right now, uh, the region is going through the, the evaluation for our RTA uh, next. Is that yes. right. Right. RTA next. And I believe, Terry, or correct me if I'm wrong, Cortero is our number one priority uh, that we put before them. And the, the early discussions that we've had as part of the region, is that the region also supports that as a high priority uh, going forward. So hopefully as part of next, it's one of the first projects that goes in. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No. 2026 is the next RTA, the RTA next is when, because the current one expires in 26, right? Yes. So nothing for the next few years. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Jane. Yeah, and um, do you have any information on the art piece at the Silver Bell Gateway location? Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Awesome. Um, so uh, <coughs> as part of the Amazon facility that was built, uh, that specific plan called out for any large uh, building greater than 40,000 square feet, which that one obviously clears. 
uh, they are required to install public art. And so Dave Denley with Van Trust was who we were working with. I said, Dave, you gotta put in public art as part of this. And he's like, oh, what do you want? What kind of art? And so what we did is we'd shown them what we had already done or that the town had done is partnering with NUSD and uh, the welding students out there. So you've got uh, the deer on Tangerine that everyone's seen. And then the roundabout in downtown, which is the, the cowboy and rider uh, and um, the cow there. And then this one is uh, two falcons uh, that they've done there. And one is landing and the other one is perched. Um, and it was a great partnership. Uh, the students did a fantastic job. The teachers did a great job. And uh, that was Marana High School. Marana High School has done all three of those projects. And uh, Daniel O'Toole is, uh, or Trevor O'Toole is the uh, local artist that has helped to design all of those. It's a great project and actually is part of our strategic plan uh, that was just a recently adopted strategic plan five. Public art is one of those that we're looking to expand uh, further. I'm not going to commit to the fact that it's all going to be endless <laughs> welding uh, <laughs> projects, but um, those projects have obviously been very well received and we're very excited about that one that's been placed there. And I know uh, Dave Denley with Van Trust was very excited about that partnership as well. Good. Yes, Terry. November 30th for Ina and Silver Bell. Ina and Silver Bell? Okay. November 30th. November 30th. Yeah. There we go. So not Thanks, quite Terry. not quite for Black Friday, but <laughs> <laughs> if anybody goes out for Black Friday anymore. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys All very right. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Okay, so our next presenter, um, presenters, um, Daniel Bradshaw, who's the Director of Landscape Architecture, and Lexi Welcott, the Project Manager for the Planning Center, give us a little presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. We're glad to be here today. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm Daniel Bradshaw. This is Lexi here, and uh, we uh, represent the Planning Center. The planning center is kind of a vague name. I've had a couple of people in here already ask us today if we worked for the town. We do not. We are private consultants. In fact, uh, we were asked today to speak a little bit about the development process generally, but in Marana, for those that work in the private sector. So uh, the first thing I'll do is I'll dismiss Jason so we can speak openly <laughs> about, uh, about how the process works in the town. No, to be perfectly honest, so the, the planning center, when we received the opportunity to work on a project in the town of Moran, we're pretty excited. Um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful jurisdiction to work in. Obviously, great, uh, uh, great clients and business owners that we work with, but also great planning staff. Um, uh, uh, you've got great, great uh, council and, and mayor to work with as well. So it's a, it's a joy to work in the town of Marana. The planning center has been uh, around for about 40 years and uh, we're headquartered in Tucson. Um, and we, we provide land use uh, planning and landscape architecture services in the area here. So uh, I like to think uh, of our role in a development project as the bookends of projects. We'll often be the first ones to step on to a new project in the planning process. And then we'll wrap things up with the landscape architecture as the project nears completion and, uh, and make these projects look real pretty from, uh, from, from you know, the, the roadways and, and the views from outside of the, uh, the sites there. Um, so uh, in addition, though, to, uh, to uh, not only providing a lot of services in Marana, a number of folks that work at the planning center, and we are a small group, uh, live up in Marana, uh, myself included. My wife teaches up uh, through MUSD. I've got kids in elementary schools, middle school, and, uh, and high school up this direction as well. So we're very, very much invested in the, uh, the success of the town and, and love to see all that Jason is showing here today, all that's happening. And we've been uh, a part of some of that. Uh, obviously there's there's so much that we couldn't be a part of all of it, but uh, we're part of some of it. And several of the recent projects that are currently under construction that we are really proud of are the, uh, the Alexander and Solstice projects, two apartment projects just south of the Target and, and Lowe's uh, south of Iron Road there. And those are, are, are moving forward very quickly, but there's so much more um, than just that. But what we thought we would do today is take uh, just a few minutes to talk about uh, the development process. If you have a, a business and you want to expand that business, or you purchase the property next to you and you're looking to expand, or you simply want to, uh, to, to prepare some land for future development in the town, well, where do you start? What do you do? And so what we did is we created a what we're calling a primer. It's a, it's a you know, half sheet of paper here, and it lists four general phases 
to any sort of develop, development process. And the reality is uh, every project is different and, and there is no you know, real one way to go about any particular project. Um, you can take twists and turns along the way there, but these are, are pretty general. And so what we're gonna do here is kind of walk you through that process. You've got land, you wanna develop it. From the perspective of a, of a private consultant, what do you do? And uh, Lexi can kind of lead the, the initial portion of this discussion here, because she focuses all, all on the, the entitlement work. And then I can talk a little bit about the site design and landscape architecture as we move through this. So, that's thanks, Daniel, and thanks everyone for having us here. It's, it's a great honor to be uh, before you all presenting uh, what we do every day, if, if you will. So um, as Daniel mentioned, oftentimes the big question of if you're trying to do something or you have a vision is where do I start? What do I do? Uh, and the first phase of this, this process is what we call the due diligence phase. So this is doing your research, figuring it out, figuring out what your rights are, what are the restrictions and encumbrances on your property, and then what is it that you need to go through to, to create this vision that you would like to achieve? So oftentimes that comes through, you know, reviewing the entitlements of your property. What is it that you, you have today? So how many of you guys are familiar with zoning? And how many of you ever been through the zoning process, whether you've participated in it like yourself or you've done it? Okay, I see some hands going. Um, but basically through this process, it, you, in the due diligence phases, you've got to explore what you have and what you can do with your property first. So oftentimes that comes through an analysis of looking at the zoning designation, looking at your general plan designation and what the town's future growth is uh, slating for this property. And then again, what are the, the other elements that are, are either opportunities or constraints on your property? And so once you move through that, do, do, oh my goodness, due diligence phase, um, we then have to ask ourselves, okay, well, what is it that we want to create and how do we get there? And so that's where you step into what we call the, the rezoning process. So phase two, and that's really further exploring all of those constraints on your property. So that's looking at investigating what type of uh, services you're going to need, infrastructure improvements, and then, you know, again, how is your vision going to get to, um, to that process? And so what we've highlighted here is, is more or less what each of those steps uh, require. So as you can see, the rezoning process is a, is a very involved process that starts with the formulation of a concept plan, taking that concept plan to our friends down at the town of Marana and saying, hey, does this work? Does this meet the town's goals, et cetera? And depending on the response you get, sometimes it could be, oh, heck no, we're not going to do that. Or it could be like, yeah, I think this could work and it's favorable for, for what we're doing. And, and we work through this iterative process up front to figure out what makes the most sense. Once we land on what makes the most sense, we move through uh, a more finalized site planning effort. So we, we take commentary, we create a plan, and then we, we go through the public process, which is more or less, uh, again, it's an iterative process where you submit your application material to the town of Marana. They review it, all of their departments review it. They suggest uh, re uh, recommendations for you know, revisions. And then once we all land on a project, they recommend it for uh, approval to move through the, the public process. And so the public process is a is a very, can be a good process, can be a bad process, to be frank with you. Uh, oftentimes it's it's an involved process, we can say that. Um, but the, the public process, after you, you've, you've gotten the town's blessing, more or less entails a neighborhood meeting where you're going to involve all property owners within 300 feet of your property. Uh, you present your, your project to them, your, your case, and then uh, you, you'll work with what the concerns they present for to uh, get your project done. Once you go through the neighborhood meeting process and uh, you, you move on to the next step of the, the public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission. And the Planning and Zoning Commission is a, a body of appointed officials who, who basically uh, analyze the merits of the case and make a recommendation to the mayor and council. And so once planning commission, they can make a recommendation for approval, denial, or not push a recommendation forward whatsoever. Um, in any event, all of whatever they recommend goes on to the mayor and council, where you then uh, go down to town, uh, town hall and you hold a public hearing and uh, you present your case before the mayor and council. They open it up for testimony from the public. It's a back and forth dialogue and uh, the council is the ultimate decider at that point. And 
once you get the approval, um, there's there's some time period before you have to you have to wait before you can go pull building permits. And so prior to going and, and pulling building permits, that's assuming you have a development plan or what have you. So the next phase is creating that. You have the certainty that you can do it, your zoning is there. And so now you go through the more formal process of engineering and, and what have you, which Daniel's gonna take over. Sure. So one of the things to mention here is as you as you have a project here and you start this process, you're doing your due diligence. Um, you decide you, you may need to rezone your property. One of the things you're going to do is you're going to pull together your, your team to help through this process, right? And that's where consultants like us participate uh, as team members. So in the rezoning process, you'll see on that list there that we list some key consultants at various points in this project. Um, when you're going through the rezoning process, you may have a land planner that helps to lead that process. You'll certainly have involvement from a civil engineer, like the traffic engineer, and there'll be others. Um, but you may not have a whole lot of input from an architect at this point. You may not have a whole lot of input from a landscape architect at this point. But as you transition from what we'll call the planning phase and your rezoning into the design phase of a project, at that point, your team gets, gets much bigger. Because at that point, your architect is going to play a major role in this process. Your landscape architect is going to play a major role. Your civil engineer will play a major role. And there are others as well. Uh, but the first thing you're going to do as you sit down with your, your new design team, you've got your, your entitlements, you're ready to move forward and craft a plan uh, that can receive approvals from the town and then ultimately be constructed uh, as, as you're going to uh, bring that team together and you're going to create uh, an iterative design process where uh, there's a lot of collaboration and feedback. Um, so the architect may present some information that affects the civil engineer and the work they're doing, and they may work and revise their plans according to the architect's recommendations and vice versa. And the landscape architect will be involved as well. Uh, and as you create this, 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 this plan, um, you, you're actually going to separate the, the site work from the architecture for the purposes of a review in the town here. So what will happen is your, your civil engineer will often lead what's called a development plan package process. And they're gonna be compiling all the site information into one package. And that package is gonna have everything from your grading information and your drainage information, your utility information to your landscape architecture. So it's gonna have native plant information in that plan. You're gonna have your landscape plans as well. And that package there will then go into uh, the town for review. Uh, while that's ongoing, the architect is often leading the creation of a, another package, and we call that the building plan package. And, and that's going to have all of your architectural plans in it, and they're supporting documents as well from structural engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and the like. Oftentimes, the development package process will start just, just before the building plan package begins, and that's to uh, allow the development package to get approvals so that, that are necessary for the, the grading of a site, which tends to be the first you know, the, the, the first true on-site construction process. Uh, so uh, in order to expedite the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the grading of a site, you really want that development package to get approved first. The building plans will come in just after that development package has, has started to receive review. And then after those, both those packages are approved, the contractor can then begin to pull permits. At that point, the construction process begins in earnest. But one of the things I, I do want to point out is as you go through the creation of plans, a development package or an architectural package, a building package, it's really wise to bring a contractor into this process early on. And the reason for that is they can provide some, some real-time feedback on costs. And as, as you know right now, uh, with, with inflation and, and supply chain issues that we've had over the past few years, the cost of construction has fluctuated significantly. And it's hard to really pinpoint where you are at any given moment. So having a contractor involved early on when you have your design team together enables you to get some real-time feedback on the cost of your project. You don't want to go through the process of getting your development package approved and your building plans uh, approved and then realize that you, you can't, we can't pay for this project. It doesn't fit in your budget. So bringing that contractor on early allows you then to revise your plans to you know, the term that, uh, that we all cringe at when, uh, when we're speaking about this process is value engineering, right? They're going to value engineer the plans. Uh, they're going to they're gonna bring it back uh, uh, on budget here. But that's a really important aspect of the process that's often overlooked. Sometimes a contractor isn't brought in until you've got approved plans. And at that point, the developer is going, uh-oh, how do we make this thing work? Um, so, so we would recommend you know, bringing, bringing that portion of the project on very early. Uh, but once you do have a, a contractor on board and you know that your plans are priced correctly and you have your approvals, at that point, contractor can begin to pull permits. And, and that's when projects become really exciting because that's when you see the, the earth moving and that's when everyone else in the community sees it happening as well and thinks, oh great, what's, what's going on here? And, and uh, then Jason gets to, to take phone calls uh, from people <laughs> about what's happening here. And, and, uh, but it's all, it's all really good and, and, and exciting at the same time. 
So with that, we wanted to, this to be kind of a conversation. We, we feel people may have questions about the entitlement process, rezoning process, the creation of a development plan package or building plans that we might be able to answer here this morning. So with that, uh, maybe we'll kind of turn time over to you all. If you've got any thoughts or any questions that you'd like to ask us, we'd, we'd love, to, uh, love to respond now. <laughs> oh, maybe not. We're, we're that thorough, apparently. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a comment. Yes. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> we, I've got two firehouse sub restaurants, one in Moran and one in the city of Tucson. The Moran one opened first, and I was actually still a banker at that time. And I'm saying this because I worked with Jay Crystal at the time when he was in development services. And it was such a pleasure to have that one stop department that I could go to and here's here's this and here's that. Now I wasn't the developer on the building. We had a landlord that did all of that. So my part was just really walking through some of those steps and then the final, you know, taking ownership of it of the business part of it. But in contrast, when we opened in the city of Tucson, a little different story. And we actually had to pay an expediter twelve hundred dollars to do all of that stuff that I was able to do with the town of Morana that you can't do in the, the city of Tucson. And I know that you're not the city, I realize that it's a town in Miranda, but I'm wondering, do you provide that kind of, if somebody doesn't want to do all the go back and forth themselves, do you do that kind of expediting for permits and that kind of thing? Is that a service that you would provide to someone? So every jurisdiction is a little different in what they require and their processes. And, and, and we, as private consultants, try to stay on top of how every jurisdiction is moving so that we can provide you know, accurate responses to questions that come out or so that we're aware of what would be expected when submitting anything to a jurisdiction. So we're, we're fairly familiar with, with, with a lot of that. The reality is when it comes to the submittal of a development plan package, that's often the civil engineer that leads that. Um, and then when it comes to the, the, the submittal of a building plan package, it's often the architect that's responsible for that. So they would be able to speak to that process a little bit better than we can. But we do know that there are expediters um, that, that, that are often used um, to, to kind of coordinate the submittal of all those plans. Um, and that uh, certainly in the city of Tucson, um, especially recently um, where review times have been really slow, um, there's been a real necessity to have someone that can come in and kind of crack a whip. Right. That hasn't really been the case in, in Miranda. So we haven't had that, that need as, as much. The, the reviews are timely. So do you um, not work with other jurisdictions, municipalities? Do you only work in Miranda? No, no, we work with everybody. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All of Southern Arizona. Well, and, and I'll say, uh, you know, from our perspective, like Daniel Mighty said, you know, they know our process very well. Um, so we, although they don't work for the town of Moreno, we see them as an extension of our department because they really help to vet a lot of things beforehand. They rarely bring something to us where we're like, there's no way in the heck this is gonna work. <laughs> uh, they know that. So they kind of temper that down uh, and bring things to us that we know for the most part are gonna be able to go through. Sometimes it's what their client wants to do and we just do our best to, to work through it. Uh, but when we have projects or developers that come from outside of the community, we always emphasize to them to try and get a local team together. Um, you'd be surprised how many engineering firms from the Phoenix area do not know how to work in our soils in Southern Arizona. And it creates a lot of headaches and a lot of challenges. And then they always come to us and say, what's the problem? What's the hang up? Uh, but if you have a local firm, uh, whether it's the engineers, the architects, you know, the planning, any of them that know our process, it saves a tremendous amount of time, energy, and headache in going through it. So uh, from our side, we appreciate the planning center and everything that they do as far as following our process and understanding our process. We're trying to do our best to not change the process, uh, just so that it's smooth for everyone to, to navigate to, because we want it done as quickly as possible. Is the uh, neighborhood meeting the most difficult part of this whole process? <laughs> have, you, have you seen the sitcom Parks and Rec? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's, 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 that's based on reality right there. That's a... <laughs> it just seems you have an uphill battle in some situations where land is, it's already been zoned for whatever it is you're going to do to it, but because people have seen it, Sid is just laying for so long, they assume that this idea that houses are going in there is just like come out of the blue and they're like, oh, you know, it's like that thing's almost going to be that. It's just 
Yeah, and it's, it's to be expected. I mean, each of us, if, if, you know, if, you've, if you've got a home, for example, that's got some open space behind you, even though that may have been planned for residences for years, but it has sat as open space for a while, you get accustomed to it. That's where you take your dog for a walk and you enjoy, you know, sitting out there and, and enjoying your coffee in the morning and, you know, watching the, you know, the, the sunrise or what, what have you. And so we, we understand that, uh, that it, it can be a bit of a shock when all of a sudden, you know, someone does move forward with, with the development, uh, you know, uh, process for that land there, and so we, we we're sensitive to that. Um, and, and, it's the hardest part. I don't know if that's it can be. You know, it really depends on the use and yeah. where you are. Sometimes yeah. it's you know if it makes sense and people want it. So for instance, in Glad Farms, if we were to come in and say we're building a grocery store, <laughs> it would be everyone would be so ecstatic about it because they've been waiting, they've been told. But if you come into Glad Farms and say, oh, I'm building a self-storage facility, you might get a little bit different uh, or apartments. I, it really depends on the use and the area of which it is. Um, if it is backing open space, you better believe it's going to be a difficult measure. Well, but I think it's a good example. That neighborhood right across the street, I understand they were very upset when this big warehouse was. Yeah, I mean, it went through an entitlement process, and, and that, that's the challenge is if you're not involved in the entitlement process, then you don't have a say when the development comes. So it's really important knowing your opportunity as folks, whether it's to participate as a member of the public or a developer with, you know, what, what your biggest challenge is going to be. Nobody knew. Nobody knew that was going to well, happen. That is a good point, though. It's really it is the entire process where you have that public participation, and so oftentimes, you know, a mailing will be sent out, and people won't really look at it, and, and they miss that process, and then you get through the entitlements, and then they're upset. Um, but that that is the the, the the opportunity to get involved, and the reality is those can be really productive processes where there is a lot of uh, a lot of collaboration and, and compromise on both on on both sides, where all of a sudden. You know, landscape borders might be enlarged or enhanced in order to provide you know some more mitigation for, for neighbors and, and that comes out of that process right or building height issues might come you know be an issue a, a talking point that is uh, that is adjusted during that process there so it's through the public process of an entitlement that there can be a collaboration between the neighborhood and the developer to create something that both sides can be happy they with. They need to come to these meetings. That's how I think. <laughs> right. yeah. How hard is that? Well, and I think I think the challenge with the neighborhood meeting, why it's not always the hardest, is because people get letters. We issue the letter as the planning center. It's on our letterhead, our envelope, and people are like, "Oh, this is spam. I'm not even reading it." Um, so they throw it away. They miss their opportunity to talk about it, and then the first, the next opportunity they get is from a letter from the town of Marana or whatever jurisdiction saying this action is happening before the planning and zoning commission come out. And so then they come out to the hearings and that's where it's hard. I think for us is like, well, nobody was at our neighborhood meeting. Nobody said a peep. And then all of a sudden we have a whole packed room. And so I think in my opinion, the more hard part is that first public hearing you have where folks are actually getting letters from the town and, and it seems like a more a bigger deal, if you will. Um, you guys mentioned uh, utilities. Um, obviously, the last couple of years, there's been some huge challenges with broadband. Do you guys consider broadband as a utility? It's it's really not in our wheelhouse. You know, we don't. The, the, the civil engineer would be working with the utility plans and utility providers uh, as planners, and landscape architects. It's just not a particular point of the development process that we're involved in. So I, I couldn't answer that. But as part of the entitlement process, they do ask if services are available. So do you have is uh, electricity available, water, sewer infrastructure, and if it's not, how are you going to get it there? So. So oftentimes, if there is not broadband in the area, there is some acknowledgement, if you will, that that needs to be. It is there. So, you know, we met the majority of us work from homes, and then we wrote to the Homes Commission. We have to be prepared to make sure that there's broadband available for these homes. You did mention traffic study, and now the case to answer more. There's two questions. One on Totally Road, when you when you really crossed with your one. I was at that first public meeting and it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, with the second development now South Lenar, and I know you've opened that road, is there a reevaluation of the previous traffic study? Because it's all projected. Now it's reality. 
when those houses were built. So there's a review process and say, wait a second, maybe, and I just say maybe, we made a mistake and this is just too many homes because there's only one way out. And then you have to make a left turn with the school on the far right of Moore Road, you gotta get to Dub Mount Bull, but that's one question. And the second question is, I know there's a four-way stop sign coming out of the Highlands of Dub Mountain at Moore Road, and I don't even know how many accidents slash fatalities there have been so far. And rumors, again, lights coming in 23, 24, nobody knows. If you got about a 12 to 15 mile from the end of Dub Mountain all the way back to Tangerine now, and we're on a curve. You come out of that south gate, you got to look both ways and go slow. Because the last thing I want to do is get hit by a car. So, what's the reevaluation to what you thought was happening and what reality is? Again, it may not be yours, it might be Jason's answer. I'm not sure. But thank you. I think it's totally my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can take a stab at it. You may not like what I have to say, and it may make him look bad. But <laughs> I can say it. <laughs> so, uh, so the, the town is constantly evaluating different traffic scenarios. Uh, also, uh, Burrell is our public works director. Uh, actually has led our traffic commission for a number of years prior to becoming the, the new director. Uh, and his team is always going out and evaluating uh, whether it's complaint driven or it's just observation. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, uh, we do follow up on it. It may not be a full blown assessment mm -hmm. uh, that is done like on as part of Daniel and Lexi's process, what they've uh, done, but you're right, it's kind of projection uh, yes. based on that. So once reality hits, uh, many times there is a reevaluation that is done by our team that looks at things, and then depending upon the scenario, we how we deal with those. And then when needed, uh, improvements are identified and then scheduled appropriately. Sometimes it's a quick fix and we're ready to get on and adjust it or move. Other times it's a traffic control device that needs to it's bigger expense and needs to be funded for the uh, The Highlands area, I believe it is 23 uh, yeah. um, for that traffic signal to point. Yeah, the, the town was successful in getting federal funding for that and safety improvements. So oh. it'll be under design for the next year or so, and then the following year it'll be under design. So that'll be 24. Our fiscal year is 24. Are we aware of how many? Um, Crashes, accidents, whatever you want, slash fatalities so far since the four-way stop sign has been implemented. Yeah, the data I believe has been implemented. We're not aware of one fatality that's occurred out there, um, but it's something that we're mindful of. We've done some minimum improvements, which yeah, will like affectionately call the green key sign, right? Which has helped um, a little bit to at least kind of know where it's coming. Um, we recognize there's a challenge in working on it with the federal funds. I had another question just because I. Oh, you, you looked at Jason oh, first. Yeah, yeah, Jason's answer. You stood up, Jason. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess this is general question time. Sure. <laughs> um, I get a lot of perspective businesses looking to move into areas and they want to get a traffic count on um, which direction and everything normally i would send them to fausto is that still fausto is the tag or where can people get those stats yeah um fausto has up-to-date data uh most of the time it does come from a regional uh it depends on which group and, and in what area uh will determine who has the most up-to-date information sometimes it's a local count sometimes it's a regional or an a dot depends on what intersection or what area you're looking for but Fausto would be able to determine or his team Dion Schwartz is our uh, division manager for traffic but if Fausto is a contact you have feel free <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, is that public information yeah it is public information you can just call them yep. I'm looking for recent traffic counts in this area there you go. Yeah, and PAG has a really great resource as well. Mm -hmm. If you just Google oh. PAGs, traffic counts, they yeah. have a whole mapping platform that you could oh. go and click just general segments. And again, if there is more up-to-date information with the local jurisdiction, you might check there. But they do have some data. Again, it's not always the most recent, but it can at least give you a date. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, and um, to wrap up, I just have a couple of people I want to kind of call on, put on the put on the spot. Um, John, anything from a town council perspective you'd like to bring up? Oh, yeah, I got so many things, but uh, you, as the chamber, we really appreciate what you do for the town. You guys are what runs the businesses and keeps the businesses encouraged about being here, and really appreciate that. And uh, just my little, my little thought of ophthalmology, but uh, oh, all the you guys did here lately is, uh, <laughs> you know how we, we, we want things, uh, this lady right over here said it, uh, when are they going to be done moving that traffic? <laughs> you know, I was listening to the Department of Transportation yesterday mm -hmm. and looking at all their numbers, and I mean, you want to get mind boggled. <laughs> I mean, that meeting, that was just a <laughs> number, but the little thing that I picked out of that was we right here are creating what the slowdown is. Because if you listen to what they said, and I'm, a, I'm construction and, and that kind of background and maintenance, they're, we're wanting the people to come build what we want to be comfortable in our lives when we're not there. So come out at night and do it. How many of you want to go do your job that you love to do at night? Oh, and then we shrunk that time because instead of, you know, splitting it up in you know, eight, 10 hour days, we're taking 12, 15 hour days to enjoy our life. And we want them to get it done in five, six hours. Uh, and just some things that I've watched over the last couple, this, this year, I'd like that new freeway we got going through more out of here pretty much. Did anybody really look at how that was going on? It took me the whole process that they were doing it to try to finally get out there with them, but I was up on the last night. Those guys shut down the freeway, one lane, well, two lanes, for one mile, and boom, went in and did that in five hours. At a big cost. <laughs> at a big cost because of the safety and all the things that they have to do repetitively that we don't do if you just shut it down alone. You know, I, I looked at my, one of my philosophies to explain to people how Moran is, was this uh, McDonald's right down here. I've been here for 35 years, and when that went in, I said, McDonald's is crazy. <laughs> you know, who's going to drive through out there? Uh, every one of them guys going to work on the, the homes here in Continental Ranch. Stop by there every morning, and that place was full at six to seven in the morning, real full of the people going to work. And then, like seven years later, you got fries over on Carroll. After all that seven years of construction, put enough stuff there for it. But the convenience, we just got to look at the convenience in each one of us. And that's what people are coming here as, as a council member. I see when we're inconveniencing them. <laughs> In building new things, in, in creating what needs to be done safe. But they're, they're just, I, I appreciate the opportunity to go to these meetings and, and information that's out there. And I, I'm, I'm no, I'm, a, I'm looking at the broad picture. I'm just here from around. And the, the chamber is our, it keeps us coming. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Northwest Fire. Hi, thank you. We're Wrapping up October's fire prevention month, and we've been having a blast talking to second graders about fire prevention and safety. And so we just remind everybody to make that conversation in their homes, participate in home evacuation plans in a non-emergency setting, so that you and your family remain safe and include your four-legged children in part of that discussion, because people are always concerned about their pets and the emergency situations that may present themselves. Additionally, Monday's Halloween, and so be extra cautious if you're driving home from work, some of the littler Trick-or-treaters may be out while the sun is setting. That's a difficult time for the two pedestrians. Slow down, be cautious, have your personal awareness, and take care of our little guys. Thank you. Terry, mm -hmm. anything from the manager's office you'd like to share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, you've heard a lot uh, you know, about so many things that are going on in the town. We'll tell you, we did just have our fall festival. Uh, last Saturday, uh, two Saturdays ago. Two Saturdays ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, three event. Uh, we did have some rain, which I think kind of scared some people away. And, and, uh, but uh, overall, really solid event. And we did the unveiling of the 
horse and rider that used to be out. Some of you probably remember the, the statue that was created by uh, and USD students back in 1994 used to sit out in front of the Circle K at uh, Miranda and I 10 for decades. And uh, we had to take that down when we uh, worked on uh, Fendario and Miranda Road area. And uh, we put it back up uh, a month or so ago at the fall festival. Uh, we're getting ready for, of course, our big uh, holiday festival, uh, Christmas tree lighting event. Lots of other stuff. The uh, community center stuff has come along really well. We've got our architect on board. We've got some beautiful uh, design stuff. We've done a lot of community meetings. Uh, we're getting ready to identify our contractor for the job. Uh, we anticipate breaking ground and starting construction on that. And completed by uh, fall. Great, fantastic, lots of great things happening. So Amanda, did you have any final think, closing comments? Um, that's it, thank you all for being here. One thing I do want to highlight, if you haven't been by the Miranda Visitor Center, please stop by, we're really proud of that. Sally Edwards, who is on our call today, um, has been doing education days. So we've done them on monsoon safety with Northwest Fire. Um, we had one on um, ranching, do ranching. We had White Sound and Ranch out there. We had, um, uh, Pina's uh, ranching program here and a lot of really cool things. One coming up is on agriculture, past, present, and future um, of agriculture in Miranda. So we have some um, historic, there's a flyer out there. Um, we have some uh, families who have been farming in this community for a long time, as well as Bea, um, to kind of show some of the differences in, in the future of farming and um, also uh, Quartiro, um, what is it, the Miranda Quartiro Water Association. Water Users Association, water users association. <laughs> um, it's going to be there. Thank you, John, for that. Um, with that, have a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, here. I want to hear more. Can I just give you a hand? Here, I'll walk you. It's not there. I just stopped mine. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there.
between men and the election. Uh, and so Ron is on Zoom in October. It was announced he's going to be the president in November. And uh, because it's so late in the election, they couldn't come in on Sunday. They got the on Sunday, Tuesday morning. And the agenda, you know, I don't know. In hindsight, I will be sure it's been hours. And so this so the agenda doesn't get updated. Judy's out to that board with his one comes in and some of them are supposed to be dropped. And it becomes a bit of a shoot. And Kim, to her credit, has shown us on the moon and changed her own way. You know, she's afraid of, you know, I mean, she's afraid of, you know, this is not this thing. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. You know, there was a, you know, just like, you know, it's a very great thing. But she wants to have a better way. Particular issue. Uh, fortunately, when I walk along, I want to really how you how and it was nothing more than your leadership, right? Here's the ours in the congressional endorsement. It's part of why he's in the worst is viability and expected them to win this next year. Just seeing if I hover, I can get any insight. Yeah, that's a lot. We're pretty transparent. Uh, uh, we, we need better centers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's, uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Have you seen any of these? Because I asked Jack, the other thing was, I had asked Contra earlier, I'm like, where's your team? Oh, they're coming. I'm like, you know, the jail pilots are out of the population. And then I asked Jack, you know, you're going to come to me and say, I'm like, so. Are you going to put something out to the members? And he's like, well, I don't have authorization to do that yet. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, that, that, it's going to be weird crap. Yeah. And I go, see how many people are saying that. The you, you need to go back to the like Yes, I like that. I think the Millers never seem to be made aware. And they were a rationale Well, I didn't like to go. I don't think 